Hi, welcome. Um, I am honored and pleased to have with me today Dr. Virgil Lattimore. He is a uh, theologian and pastor in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Dr. Lattimore is the president of Hood Theological Seminary, and he has joined us today or joined me today to talk to us a little bit about why Black Lives Matters matters to people of faith and how um, how this is an important time in our country and in our world for us to be hearing voices um, of color. And so thank you very much, Dr. Latimer, for joining me today. Well, thank you for this invitation. Um, as, as Professor has indicated, I am, uh, I am president of Hood Theological Seminary, and I'm also a um, uh, a pre professor of pastoral psychology and counseling uh, at, at the seminary uh, where I've, I've, I've taught here for eight years, but I worked 22 years at another seminary, another Methodist school in, in Ohio. Uh, I also spent um, 26 years as an Air Force chaplain and so got to travel around the country relative to that. I grew up in North Carolina and went to Livingstone College and uh, Duke Divinity School, and then uh, uh, Northwestern University for doctoral work. So um, why does um, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, uh, why is it important, I think, for college students? Um, um, my experience, um, first of all, was, was um, uh, growing up in the South, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, where for the first eight years of my life, I was in a um, hundred percent African American uh, black schools, um, um, and uh, in the eighth grade, my parents moved to the suburbs and bought their first home, and I then went to newly, fairly newly integrated uh, schools, and was. Um, and, and sometimes the only African American in that in that experience. Um, if you've not been in a situation where you have been uh, one of of the only kind, whether you're talking race or gender, or uh, even sometimes geographic, uh, that that makes a difference in terms of perspective. So, from the standpoint of perspective, I think the issue of of, of Black Lives Mattering, uh, and, and, and some of you, maybe if you've had historic uh, history courses, have, have, have been introduced to the history of, of America, that, that um, in terms of its, its evolution, uh, in terms of immigrants, in terms of, of particularly um, persons of color, uh, that um, they have often had to uh, uh, um, press and protest for rights to be recognized as as human beings, and as particularly, I'm, I'm from my perspective as, as African Americans, the issue of moving from being defined as as less than human, three fourths a person, three fifths a person, to the issue of of gaining, and it's interesting that this uh, we're now in an election season. Uh, protesting and and uh, pressing for the right to be recognized as 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 a human being, as an equal human being, uh, with the uh, larger population. So uh, I think that that has been important, moving from from that position of uh, being less than human to being recognized as human, although uh, being seen as second class or less than. Uh, has been an important issue. And, and faith, I think um, you might ask, well, how can a, can, a, can a people, a race of people move from uh, being that in that position of being defined as less than and then persist? Uh, my great, my great grandmother, uh, on, yeah, my maternal great grandmother told of the experience when my great grandfather died there were two large white men in suits who came, and that's when the funerals, uh, and, and this was races, uh, had separate funeral homes and 
but what we held funerals, uh, uh, what was called the repast of the way our uh, calling hours in the home. And I remember my great grandfather being in the parlor in in the in the in the in the casket. And so my I was uh, I was at their home, and these two large uh, uh, Caucasian men came in suits. And so I said to my brother, I must have been eight or nine years old. And I said, who are these uh, white guys coming to uh, to visit uh, my great grandmother's house? And so my brother, who's a year older, said to me, these are the two, these are two men that my great grandmother helped raise. And she was what was then called a, a wet nurse. She actually nursed, these two men were both now lawyers and they were, they were big, they looked like football players. And um, she had, in fact, uh, when she worked in the home, cooking, cleaning, ironing, and being, an, in essence, a nanny uh, for um, very meager earnings a week, we, we would be insulted to, to know that she used to say she used to make about a about, dollar about a, a week in that work um, for, for the week's work. And uh, this was really almost post uh, pro-slavery, post-reconstruction. And um, that, that was an amazing thing. So I guess the, one of the issues is, is to understand, and that's just a microcosm of the contributions that African-Americans have made uh, in the building of this country. I was, I was looking uh, several months ago, uh, I was looking on Facebook and I saw this picture of actually a college student uh, African-American female sitting on the ground and she had a, a sign raised up and on the sign it says, I have a right to burn down a country that I helped build. Now, whether you agree, and, and I was, uh, I've shared that story, that, that reflection, uh, not, not endorsing the issue of, of violence or, but to, understand and to be sensitive to the feelings of that young woman. And she wasn't burning. She's sitting on the ground, uh, reflecting on, and, and in a way, protesting uh, her, dis, her dissatisfaction with the way things were going. That is, in, in, the, in, the, in the wake of the death of, of George Floyd. And I think that issue it's interesting that the death of an African American man could spark uh, a kind of 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 rising up, and and it wasn't just African Americans who saw in living color what was taking place of a man who's you could you could see life being taken from him, and him going back to the primal scream of what happens to a child when a child is being hurt and it cries out for its mother and and he's you know he's calling for his mother as as if as if he's a, a young child being hurt so i think the the issue of of black lives matter it's it's a movement but it is also in response to what similar to what took place during uh, uh, during the '60s, and many many of you were not born at that time, but when uh, persons were trying to fight for the right to vote, uh, you know, on the you know the the legal the legality of said that persons had the right to vote, but then there was there were a number of issues going um, taking place to discourage persons from. Uh, exercising the, the right to vote. And uh, we've seen this happen with, with women having to press uh, their, uh, you know, their right to vote and then African-Americans. And, and, and so that is in that kind of stream. And I think it requires a kind of, of listening. Again, I'm not suggesting that you have to agree. And I don't certainly agree with the fact that violence or but but that protest which is which which is embedded in the heart of this country the right to for redress to 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 speak 
uh, to cry out. And that's really what uh, a person's, a lot of what we see, and we know we, we, we have evidence that some of the, most of the uh, movements of Black Lives Matter, the protests have been nonviolent, but there have been elements that have, that have been a part of that, that, that are probably desperate and have, have created uh, some violence. But I, I think the, the ultimate uh, challenge is to pause, is to pause and listen, and then to ask persons, uh, to have conversations with persons uh, who are different than, than you are to say, okay, how, how has that been for you? And I could tell you stories, even as, as, as a chaplain in the United States Air Force where I've traveled, and I'll give you one example. I, um, as my, and I ended up being the highest ranking African-American chaplain in the United States, African-American Air Force chaplain. Uh, I, I was the first and, and I'm still the only African-American chaplain to make the rank of Brigadier General. Now, so when I used to travel and go to a base, they, I, I'd get invited to go and be a prayer breakfast speaker and I'd go into a base and, and I'd go to the security. If you ever been to a military base, you know, you got security guards at the base and you have to share your ID. So I have my ID out. And of course I'm in uniform and, I, and, and, I, and this happened on more than, it happened on several occasions. So I'll, again, and I present my ID now, I'm in uniform and I've got my, I've got my, my, my one star on my shoulders. I've got my cross on my, over my heart, which is my you know, professional symbol. And they've got, they've got my ID. So, so the security guard held up, would hold up the ID card to see if the hologram you know, it, it, it has a special code. You can see that. And then they look back at me and they, and then he'd look at the card again, because the issue is in their experience and, and, and on all three uh, occasions, they had never, number one, most had never seen a Brigadier General chaplain, African-American, Hispanic, whatever. But then they have never, would, would not even imagine that the person that they are that they are um, reviewing is is an is an African American chaplain. Maybe this this person is is an imposter. I don't know. So that so they, they so they would say, well, I've never seen a chaplain with a star. Now I know what they really want to say. I've never seen a black a black chaplain. With, so and and in in a couple of cases they had the um, marquees on the base with the letters that go electronically, did digitally. So I would look over at the, on a couple, two, two occasions, I looked over at the, at the uh, jumbo, where they call them a jumbotron. And I said, you see uh, the person, it says, welcome Brigadier General Lattimore. That's what, they, and they said, oh, you, oh, you are the, yeah. So what, what I want to point back to though, is the phenomenon of what a lot of African Americans experience of being legitimate, of being valid, of, 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 of our very presence being suspect, you know, no matter how much education, no matter how much, how well we dress, how well we speak, sometimes in environments where that is seen as suspect. And uh, if you talk to a number of African Americans, they can tell you similar experiences where they have, they have, they have, um, I'm a member of Rotary in Salisbury, North Carolina. In fact, I'm the president elect. And for next year, we had a judge, uh, a, 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 um, an appellate court judge to come and speak to the group. And he tells of the experience of being in a store and he had his phone in his, under his coat, which kind of bulged out. Well, the, the clerk assumed that it was a gun. And so now again, she didn't raise that to him while he was present asking him, you know, so he made his purchase and left the store. Well, when he, when he, she left, he left, she called the police and told what kind of car he was in. Well, the police went after him. They stopped him. They made him get out of his car. They, they, they handcuffed him. And uh, 
And of course he asked, now he's a judge. He said, now what is, what is this about? Finally, and they said, well, we got a report that you had a gun. Well, no, he, and he wasn't, you know, raising the gun in the store, wasn't doing, and they said, uh, I don't have a gun. And they said, well, yeah, they said you had a gun under your coat. So he said, this is my telephone. This was his cell phone. And of course they apologize and all that. So now part of the, the issue of if whether, you know, I have, I have been stopped probably, I don't know, it's probably four or five times over the years. Um, and, and, um, and asked an explanation of why, well, you know, one case I was with my wife, we were, we were in Syracuse, New York, and, um, and I had a sports car, I had a, I had a Firebird uh, car, but, and, and my wife was very light. She is very, she, she is as, as, as light as most Caucasian. So, but she's African-American and, uh, I, and they stopped me and it was, we were heading to a Christmas party and I was upset because number one, they're gonna make us late. And finally, um, uh, and I just sat and just waited because part of the, the issue is, is having to keep cool because this is in before uh, a lot of the shootings and things like that being, but I, I think we learned very early uh, in life that encounters with, with police officers uh, can end up tragically. If you, in other words, you need to keep cool and keep your head and be about what you're about. And so I, I was sitting there and I was getting upset. My wife said, don't, I said, why are they stopping us? And finally he came back and I said, Oh, well, we got a report of a car like this being stolen. Well, you know, I, you know, the car wasn't stolen. I mean, and he'd even raised the issue of the fact that I had a different license plate than what my light in words that it, my, it was licensed to North Carolina, but it, I had a, I mean, I had a North Carolina license, but I had uh, New York plates. But anyway, those kinds of things are, are, are somewhat irritating, but the issue is, um, my four parents put up with more more than that. So the, the issue of when, when, so when we see a very uh, blatant example of someone whose life is being disrespected or maybe unjustly uh, being taken, it, 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 um, it leads to uh, um, a very visceral reaction. And so that's, uh, part of my own experience as a as a as a teacher, as a military person who served this country, as someone who has been involved in human relationships to be to help people be reconciled and understand each other. I think that's what it calls for. And I'd like to share a couple of thoughts from persons who have who who are who are probably more even more more uh, serious thought thinkers than I am. Um, uh, most of you may have heard of a young woman named Harriet Tubman. She happens to be a member of my, she was a member of my denomination, the AME Zion Church. And she devoted, even once she got her freedom to going back and freeing others. It wasn't enough to just to enjoy her own freedom, but she wanted to free members of her family and for other members. And when she retired, she had 33 acres of land that she created a home for the aged, persons in the community, the homeless. She took in abused women. So she was quite a, quite a person. So she says, she says this, um, I had reason out in my mind, there was two things I had a right to, liberty, or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. For no man could take me alive. Now, this is a woman who has been a slave, who has been abused as a slave, who is now free, and who is saying two things matter to her, liberty or death. And we've seen that on some, some states have said, what, give me liberty or give me death. Um, Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who is uh, one of the greatest historians in this country, uh, sociologist, historian, activist, uh, 
said, and, and, and Harriet Tubman said what she said in 1868. Um, W.E. Du Bois said this in 1897. Now you imagine early on in this country when it's struggling with the issues of slavery and so forth. He says this, it is a peculiar situation, a sen sensation, the double consciousness, the sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others. One ever feels the two-ness, an American, a Negro, and he used the term Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two warring ideals in one dark body, uh, one dark body whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. In other words, he's saying this struggle of, of, of wanting to be wanting to be fully an American and, and yet being being defined and boxed in as a as a black person and as brilliant as he as he was um, um, and I'll just share a couple of a couple of more now more more con in a contemporary way you've 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 heard of the words and you've heard him speak and talk about um, um Good Trouble, uh, John Lewis, and uh, the Congressman Civil Rights icon who, who died uh, several months ago. He says this, 65 years have passed and I still remember the face of young Emmett Till. Emm young Emmett Till was a young man who in the South was uh, killed because they said he had whistled uh, at a white woman and uh, the notion was that he had a kind of a lisp. So he was in passing uh, on the sidewalk, he had kind of a lisp as he spoke. But anyway, they said he, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was taken, he was arrested and he was taken from his jail. So not tried, he was lynched, beaten and so forth. And he says, he says this, and he, uh, John Lewis is reflecting, despite real progress, I can't help but think of young Emmett Till today as I watch the video after the unarmed black American being killed and falsely accused. My heart breaks for these men and women and their families and the country that let them down again. My fellow Americans, this is a special moment in our history, just as people of all faiths and no faiths and all backgrounds, creeds, and colors band together decades after the fight for equality and justice in peaceful, orderly, nonviolent fashion. We must do so again. And, and I've, I've been really amazed at the fact that the Black Lives Matter movement has affected not just African Americans, but it because I think the issue of Black Lives Matter is one that says you know, usually the re one response is all lives matter. Well, let's, let's pay close attention. If you lived on a street and your house is on fire, you're gonna say my house matters. Now it, it's not helpful for your neighbors to come and say it, all houses matter. All, yes, all houses matter, all people. But the issue is if your house is on fire and that's, I want to translate that to the kind of crisis that is in and takes place in the African American community in every in every measure that you can come up with. I can point to, and I won't quote any statistics to you. We can talk about the health disparities or the economic disparity in terms of life income or what people make per year. And it's and so. Yes, all lives matter, but the, right now and for the last 400 years, the value of black life has often been more diminished than other lives. And we can look at the health statistics, we can look at uh, mortality, uh, the, the more, uh, more, more, more the, uh, the death rates of infants, infants that die in childbirths. In, in every, almost every statistic, African Americans come out on a lure. Although, you know, in some ways, you know, we could look at some, what's happening with the, our, the native peoples of this country in terms of suicide and things like that. 
uh, we may be competing with some of them for some of that, for some of those numbers. Um, so that's why I think that the issue of saying that black lives, black minds, black bodies uh, matter. You, you all should know, given the fact that I am, I am a, a retired member of the United States Air Force, African Americans have fought in every war in this country, have fought for freedom and for the values that this country stands for. Yet in, in some of the early history of this country, they were not given the same benefits for fighting. Um, you know, I've got relatives who let's say, fought in World War I and II. When they uh, returned from war, some of them didn't have the same benefits. They weren't given the same benefits, like uh, with, with the whole issue of, of the of veterans' benefits. They they weren't given those because they the law says that they weren't they weren't deserving of them. Yet they had put their lives on the line to preserve this great democracy and this great country. Uh, and that's why I go take you back to the sign of the young lady sitting on 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 the lawn with her sign hanging up we have every right to burn down a country that we help build. And again, I'm not, in, I'm not endorsing that as a strategy. I am suggesting that you need to understand where that comes from in terms of the pain, of the pain and frustration that often we have not uh, received the same fruits, the fruits of those, uh, of the, uh, of, 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 of freedom and justice for all. Um, and uh, that, that's not often uh, been the case. Many of you may remember, no, you won't remember the, the great Barbara Jordan, Cong uh, Congressman Barbara Jordan out of Texas. Uh, and during the great, during the Watergate um, hearings, again, again, I'm, some of, I'm quoting history that some of you weren't even born when that took place as she, and, and just an articulate woman, and she talked about, you know, when this country, uh, when the constitution was written and um, that it, it, and she said uh, that uh, when it was written, now in the heart of it, it may have been a, a sense of, 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 of inclusion for everybody, but her, her, her assessment was that it did not include me meaning as an African-American woman, that it, when it was written, it didn't, it didn't really state that that, that that was the case because uh, slavery was, you know, many of the framers were slaveholding and, and they didn't make the connection theologically, ethically, what we're doing, they were doing a wonderful earth shattering of uh, framing an earth shattering document. Now, which later, you know, came to, and its true meaning later came to include uh, others that weren't, you know, women and, and blacks. It later came to be interpreted to include those, but when it was framed, it did not address that. It did not address the humanity of the people that they owned, that that people could own other people, and had and and do it. Uh, in the name of, 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 of manifest destiny, that, that God had in fact made this so, when in fact uh, it was, it was um, you know, even this land, even, you know, I, I was learning the other, uh, the other day the meaning of, and I'll encourage you to go look up the meaning of Oklahoma. Um, well, I'll tell you, the meaning of Oklahoma, and I, I, didn't, I didn't know this, is... Um, red people, that that's, it's, it's, I think it's red, yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's red people. Oklahoma, the word, that there are two Indian words put together, and it's like, it, it means red people. So Oklahoma at some point was, was owned by the native peoples, and then, and then you had all the treaties that were written that were uh, in every, in, in almost in every instance, every treaty that we when I say we or the Americans made with the native peoples has been violated, it was violated. So now they, and so now they suffer because 
their culture has been violated. So you have the highest rate of, 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 of um, child death, the highest rate of suicide, highest rate of unemployment, you have high rates. So what happens when a, when a people you know, are, 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 are defeated and, and whose land and culture has been, and, and they're fighting back now to maintain that as even as, 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 as there, are, there are efforts to uh, go build pipes and through, their, through some of their sacred lands and they're fighting to, to, to push back. Now, I'm gonna sort of relate that to African-Americans who, who see instances of lives being taken. And so the issue of pushing back to say, you know, our lives matter. We just can't be, you know, and, and you know, in an instance, um, you know, as, as we train police officers and I've got relatives that have been police officers, the issue is why are they so afraid of me versus being afraid of, of one of you? I mean, as to say, I mean, I, you know, get stopped and I'm, I'm a suspect. And so I, I, I need to keep my cool and, and follow protocols to help them not overreact to see me as a threat. So, yeah. So, so the issue of, 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 um, of, of, of life having value and not having to fight every day, although, you know, um, usually in encounters, um, you know, having, having studied some of this psychologically, I, I've, I've got some tools that I can respond to it and that I've had to share with my sons and my daughter, mostly my sons, my African-American sons, to say, look, if you're stopped by a police officer, you just, be, you just sit there and be cool. You keep your hands on the steering wheel you don't go looking in the dashboard for uh, for the uh, registration. You wait till the officer asks you what what they want, and you 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 comply. In other words, and that's a way to help them stay keep to help them stay alive, and not to uh, uh, provoke an officer that may be afraid of them because he has a gun. He or she has guns, and I don't have you know. I don't, you know, we don't, you know, I don't carry a gun, but so that's, that's some of the uh, thinking that um, I wanted to share relative to the issue of, of Black Lives Matter. Um, the, um, I'm in a number of conversation groups with persons and part of the challenge that we have is uh, ensuring that persons are, are, are assessed on the same standards, that the playing field is, 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 um, is, is somewhat equal, or again, that there is, there's an equal treatment uh, when there are encounters. Um, it, is, it, is, um, it, is, it, is, it is something that I think uh, uh, is, a, is, is that this country, when I say our, our country, America, in the United States has to come, and I think we're at a moment of reckoning right now. And I think that's what that's what we see nationally, and and even other countries have taken up. They've always kind of followed the United States as a leader, just like when we, when when Dr. Martin Luther King in the in the in the late fifties and sixties, saying we shall overcome. Well the, well, the people in South Africa, when they dealt with apartheid, they took that up. The people in, in, in Chinaman Square, they began to take up those same songs. So the issue of freedom is not just our notion, is, um, is it's something that we have imported to other parts of the world. And they've looked to us as being kind of an example because we, we're probably one of the greatest experiments in democracy I mean that 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 in the world has ever seen. Uh, but the challenge is whether we can, and and I and I will leave it to to, uh, to many of you as young leaders and first generation college students to say what is it that you need to not just I mean I want you to exploit your education and get you know become the professionals and the teachers and the uh, engineers and all that you can be. 
but how will you now, what will you do with the inheritance that you're given uh, in this world uh, to shape it so that there can be, um, uh, there can be real conversation about wh who we are as a nation and, and, and what we do, what, what we need to do to uh, continue to be a beacon uh, for love and respect and understanding and growth. Uh, otherwise, I think we're going to be in for some real uh, challenging times that, uh, uh, you know, uh, will, will, uh, that could potentially uh, un undermine this great uh, gift that we have been a privilege to experience. So maybe that will stop there. And I'm uh, hopefully what I've shared will stimulate some conversation, but I encourage you, um, whether you're an athlete or whether you are, are, are a French major or, or history major or, or English major, in your classrooms, uh, you know, when there are people who uh, may not look like you to encourage, at least my experience is that some of the greatest experiences I've had were when I reached out to people who I imagine felt similarly to the way I felt when I was in those situations. Like I've been in classrooms where I was the only African-American when I was in seminary, at, 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 at seminary uh, and, and in graduate school. And uh, yet I, I, you know, I, had a, I, I knew I had a right to be there that my life mattered and that what I was gonna study mattered. And, uh, and, and so I know I knew if I wanted to learn, I needed to reach out, I needed to reach out. But also uh, I think there, there is a responsibility for those of you who may, uh, who may have the luxury of not necessarily being in, in, being, a, being in a minority position to at least engage others and, and to become partners, or at least be willing to become partners in, in the conversation. And um, it's not that we have to all believe alike or, or worship alike, but I think uh, uh, the whole issue of respecting and understanding uh, is a two-way street. And so even, even, although at oftentimes the persons who are in the oppressed statue uh, a situation have to make, uh, you know, make the move uh, and I would suggest that it needs to go the other way, that, that you need to take some risk and uh, ask some questions and, and be open to, to learn uh, uh, about how the other, how the other lives and what that's, what that's like. So um, I, I, I um, commend you for your, your efforts to improve your lives uh, in, in, in terms of higher education. But uh, I think the real uh, higher education uh, will, will, will come when you finish college and get into the real world. I mean, I'm, hopefully you've been doing some of that because I think good education has also taken you into the real world so that you're not, you don't leave and just have, have uh, cognitive information and not real grounded uh, understanding of, of who people are and what they struggle with. So with that, I will, I will stop. Um, and let you have conversations to talk about what I've shared. Um, just one perspective, as I learned in a, from a philosophy teacher when I was in college, we were talking about, there was, we, you know, people in the class would say, well, what's the black experience? And so my philosophy teacher, who was a PhD philosophy teacher said, well, there's no such thing as the black experience. There are black experiences. In other words, what I've shared with you is my experience as an African-American, but I'm not just an African-American. I'm also a teacher, a president, uh, a military veteran. Um, I'm, a, I'm a son of the South. You know, I've grown up with, with some of you, uh, some of your parents, hopefully not grandparents, but some of your parents. So I think um, we, we all have different experiences. And so my experience matters as an African-American, my experience matters, my culture matters, my black life matters, and, and so my black mind matters. And that's why I would say black lives matter. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Dr. Lattimore. It's such a pleasure to see you again and to get to share this conversation with you. And well, thank, thank you, you for sharing your wisdom with us. I appreciate it. Well, thank you.